Just like its horse hoovering sky disc from Parts Unknown, Jordan Peele's third film, Nope, has layers that just keep unfolding. Like his previous two entries, the movie is rife with allegory, symbolism, social commentary, and references. I'm Chris Goodmakers, and I'm here to get into the floating gullet of Nope. Spoilers ahead for Nope. It's fun to say. Nope. Among a bunch of other things, Nope is a tale of two legacies. The Haywoods, who trace their lineage back to the first moving picture, and Juke Park's residual fame from his child actor days. His personal monument to his past, Jupiter's Claim, leans heavy on nostalgia for his former glory. Most of the park, understandably, is dedicated to his starring role in Kid Sheriff. That's not really what he's famous for, though. That role would be his 90s sitcom Gone Wrong, Gordy's Home, about a family living with a retired chimpanzee astronaut that had the titular Gordy return to its wild state and mauling people during a taping of the show. No, 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 Gordy, no, no! In a nod to that moment of fame, all of Jupiter's claim employees are in the same color scheme as his character's outfit from Gordy's home. Of course, by the end of the movie, it's clear Jupe feels he has a new claim to fame to build his name on, feeding mysterious flying space aliens horses for the amusement of ticket-buying guests. It's a perfectly reasonable plan that no way could go horribly, horribly wrong. Ever the savvy opportunist, he knows the big money is in merchandising. What would a cheesy roadside attraction be without a collection of novelties you'll forget why you bought before you get home? The plushy aliens have a bit of subconscious nostalgia to them as their heads resemble the film magazine on the set of the Gordy's Home sitcom. While Jupe making his little film magazine Spacehead Aliens might have been a subconscious choice or just a coincidence given the popularity of the big head, big eye alien image. But it's definitely intentional on the part of Peel. That's because multi-camera sitcoms are not shot on film cameras. They don't have those magazines on them. The magazines and the connection were intentional, like almost every detail, big or small, over the course of the movie. If you need more proof of how deliberate the choices were in Nope, you can return to Jupe's really bad idea. Ever the showman, he begins to set the stage for what he thinks is about to happen. As a part of his pre-show to the pre-show, so to speak, he tells Jean Jacket's future dinner that in one hour, they will have witnessed something spectacular. In real time, an hour later, the movie comes to an end. Turns out he was telling us, the audience, that you have an hour of spectacle left. The complexity of getting that right for such a subtle thing is on par with the rest of the movie. While there's a general rule of thumb that a page of screenplay equals one minute, the reality is that time is elastic when cutting the final product together. So making sure that the speech happens one hour before we all get up and rush to the bathroom is no small feat. There's another bit of significance with time in the movie, specifically with Jupe. Jupe describes the attack on Gordy's home as 6 minutes and 13 seconds of terror. Later in the movie, Jupe presents his star lasso experience based on a pattern of jean jackets starting to hunt at 6.13 p.m. every night. Biblical verses appear throughout the movie. Revelation 6.13 discusses stars falling from the sky like figs do a tree. The novelty camera well on Jupiter's claim also has its own hidden depths. For the climax, it becomes Emerald's last chance to get that Oprah shot of Jean Jacket by timing the souvenir picture just right. In a way, this mirrors her own family's claim to fame. The camera in the movie is to allow tourists to be part of a poster for Kid Sheriff that shows kids looking down a well. The camera is set up for a novelty souvenir not meant to capture any moment, but is enlisted in getting that Oprah shot. The horse-trotting photographs themselves were not made with the idea of inventing moving pictures. It was commissioned by Leland Stanford of Stanford University fame. Stanford wanted to prove that the conventional wisdom regarding the way a horse's legs move was all wrong. He then commissioned Edward Mybridge to figure out how to take a series of photographs of a horse in motion. Stanford was right, but while it provided valuable insight into the way horse's legs move in motion, all involved seemed to miss out on the weight of the thing they accidentally invented, the moving picture. Another example of the insane amount of detail in this movie comes from a little bit of exposition early in the movie. We meet our leads OJ and Emerald while on the job as movie animal wranglers. OJ is very understanding and respectful of animals. That makes him ill-suited for parts of this job that require him to be a spectacle, like the safety meeting for having a horse on set. His sister's flair for spectacle unfortunately makes her ill-suited to convey the information needed. Since you can't tell a film crew anything, they all just charge in, ignoring OJ's warning, until they spook Lucky the Horse 
horse with a mirrored reference ball, resulting in him being let go. Confirming the family's bio presented by Emerald, crew member Finn Bachman refers to them as movie royalty. Finn was played by Oz Perkins, who has his own film pedigree reaching all the way back to the beginning of the film industry. His father is Anthony Perkins, known for playing Norman Bates in Hitchcock's Psycho. Well, a, a boy's best friend is his mother. His grandfather, who he is named after, has an acting career that reaches back to the silent era. His mom's side is no slouch either. Both his mom, Barry Benson, and Aunt Marissa Benson had acting careers of their own, with his aunt acting in a movie by another director obsessed with detail. She was in Barry Lyndon, directed by Stanley Kubrick. The Haywoods employ their own version of Edward Maybridge in their quest for that important Oprah shot in the form of a nature cinematographer with the impossibly cool sounding name, Antlers Holst. Like Maybridge, Holst employs a variety of modified cameras and setups just to get the right footage of Jean Jacket in motion. Unfortunately, his obsession with spectacle means that footage went with him when Jean Jacket scooped him up. But seriously, what's up with the name? Well, composer Gustav Holst is best known as the composer of the symphonic suite, The Planets. If you're a Star Wars fan who hasn't listened to the planets, you're in for a bit of a treat. But it's not that he's a composer that wrote a piece about space. Holst was notoriously bothered by the fame his composition brought him and spent most of the rest of his life trying to distance himself from the scrutiny that came from his newfound fame. Antlers Holst in the movie warns Emerald about the nature of the fame and notoriety Emerald seeks, saying, The stream you're chasing, the one where you end up at the top of the mountain, the dream you never wake up from. Sharing an attitude towards fame as his namesake. Okay, but what about antlers? Well, the name Gustav means God's staff in Scandinavian, and the staffs that the gods were depicted carrying had antlers on top of them. Certainly Jordan Peele isn't gonna stop at three horror movies, but his first three each become a part of a cinematic trilogy. In his first film, Get Out, Chris Washington has to use cotton in his ears to prevent him from being hypnotized. In Us, the tethered are unable to speak intelligibly. In Note, when OJ realizes Jean Jacket was an animal, he was able to figure out that not looking at it would make it less likely to attack. Hearing, seeing, and speaking are the elements demonstrated by the Japanese maxim of the three wise monkeys. Hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil. There are less esoteric connections between the films. The red-handled scissors that feature in Us are on Jupe's desk, and at one point they visit Cobblepot's Grove that appears in Us as well. The name Cobblepot's Grove itself is a reference to the Richard Donner movie The Goonies. Along with Spielberg, Richard Donner is a director notable for his use of spectacle in film, including the 1978 Superman the movie with the pitch, You'll Believe a Man Can Fly. Some details do come down to convenience. For instance, when Peel needed a movie for OJ to have worked on with his father, he did the math and looked at when movies came out when OJ would have been 12 and the Dwayne The Rock Johnson vehicle, The Scorpion King, fits the bill. It does end up contributing to a reoccurring theme of invisible work. OJ and his father had trained the horse that had been promised to Emerald because it was an opportunity for bigger work in the future. When the movie switched to camels, all of that work disappeared. The crew hoodie features prominently in the climax. The sweatshirt is bright orange, the color of orange juice, or OJ, and Emerald wears green throughout the movie. Emerald also shares a name with the spectacular Emerald City from The Wizard of Oz. There are many nods to filmmakers that emerged out of the late 70s and 80s, including Spielberg, Richard Donner, and John Landis, who even gets a nod at the end. Starting with National Lampoon's Animal House, Animal House's credits are already notorious for the text that told the audience how the lives of the various students turned out after they graduated. Babs ends up as a tour guide at Universal Studios. At the time, Universal would advertise its tour with a card at the end of the movie. Landis created a similar card that added, Ask for Babs. Nope ends with a similar title card, inviting people to visit the Nope ride at Universal Studios. The opening credits are evocative of the 1950s style science fiction and horror movies, especially ones that feature UFOs. But naturally, there's another layer to them. As the fluttering gauze gives way, we find ourselves looking down on the Haywood Ranch from the sky the way Jean Jacket would see it from the perch in the static cloud. In fact, the opening credit sequence is meant to be the view from Jean Jacket's mouth, which also has a lens quality to it. If the now famous replication of the Akira slide wasn't enough to let you know that Peel is a bit of an anime fan, when Jean Jacket unfolds into its final form, you know for sure. 
Jean Jacket's transformation was inspired by animals like the octopus, who when threatened will unfold its body to look larger and more menacing, which honestly is a bit hypnotizing to watch. When Jean Jacket finally does stop its slow transformation, the design was inspired by the angels from Neon Genesis Evangelion. Both the Evangelion angels and Jean Jacket's final form also happen to closely reflect the way angels are described in the Bible, which can get pretty elaborate. In what seems like a remarkable coincidence, when the Haywoods need to do a little tech shopping, they end up going to a Fry's Electronics that appears to be suffering from its own alien invasion. But that would be the Fry's Electronics they would go to. Many of the Fry's locations were all decorated with their own theme, and the one located in Burbank, California was themed after a 1950s UFO invasion movie, complete with the crashed flying saucer and the jeep sliced in half by alien heat rays in the entryway. There's even a 1950s style lunch counter in the back. The Haywoods would have had to gone to that Fry's before February of 2021, though, because after that, all Fry's retail locations were closed down and Fry's ceased to be. The co-founder of Fry's, Randy Fry, and his wife and Bay Area news anchor, Vicky Lavakis, were on hand for the filming in the now defunct store and ended up getting invited to be one of the audience members at the Star Lasso experience. There's one connection that may or may not be intentional, but was made by Fast Company's Joe Berkowitz. In his article, he draws parallels between Jean Jacket, the theme of spectacle as an illusion and distraction, and the famous Balloon Boy hoax. In 2009, it was reported that a six-year-old Falcon Heen had been trapped in a UFO-shaped balloon that was now adrift and out of control. The uninterrupted coverage of the balloon with its six-year-old passenger dominated the news until it was discovered that Falcon was just hiding and was never in any danger. Berkowitz pointed out that people were upset, essentially that the boy was completely safe the entire time, sold a false narrative of spectacle where they get to watch in real time if someone lives or dies. And it's this theme of spectacle that ties the entire movie together. Peel has said in interviews that the central theme of Nope is spectacle and how it shapes and manipulates desires as well as exploits. The exploitation of spectacle is central to Jean Jacket itself. OJ determines that as a predator, eye contact is what will draw Jean Jacket to you and your best defense is the nearly impossible, not to look. Jean Jacket consumes most of the people who are drawn in or try and exploit its own spectacle. Jupe's Star Lasso show ends up consuming the audience literally in the same way the commodification of spectacle threatens to consume those drawn to it. Jupe is himself a spectacle. He has only learned to view himself through that lens. To tell his story, he refers to the Saturday Night Live sketch about the event, going so far as to call Chris Kattan, who plays Gordy, a force of nature. The much talked about shoe is Peel's way of demonstrating the distracting nature of spectacle. In the midst of a brutal attack by the Gordy chimpanzee, Jupe's and our attention is fixated on the impossible shoe, a spectacle within a spectacle that draws your attention away from the real threat. Holst, who states the thesis early on that the dream that Emerald is chasing is not one you wake up from, in this case the American dream, is himself consumed by spectacle as he puts himself at further and further risk to capture even more. Emerald, who lives in the social media sphere, is defined by the search for spectacle, which fuels her need for the Oprah shot. Peel has modernized the work of the situationalist, social theorists and artists from the 60s and 70s, in one of their foundational works by Guy Debord called The Society of the Spectacle. Among other things, it argues that the commodification of the spectacle has replaced lived experience with aspirational experience in pursuit of the spectacle or to live via the spectacle rather than genuine lived experiences. In many ways, they managed to predict the social media age and influencers, where collection of images becomes the mediator of social interaction. We supplement lived experiences with aspirational experiences within the spectacle. Like Peel's statement in Nope, the power over spectacle we have is the one with the Paul Anka guarantee, just don't look. But the situationalist presented another option, detournament. Essentially use the spectacle to undermine and subvert it. Like a mannequin dressed like a protester in Bloomingdale's, the power to resist comes from the group being manipulated by spectacle is to indulge in dialects, or an examination of the truth and origin of opinions. As modern movies challenge the norms that movies themselves created, they create a dialect on why we believe certain things. Peel goes one better on the situationalist by creating the cornerstone of the modern spectacle, a blockbuster film that is ultimately a critique of the society of the spectacle. 
using the spectacle to invite us to examine our relationship to the spectacle. Sort of like using the last entry on a video about tiny details in a major movie to discuss philosophical art movements of the late 20th century. But Peel started it. It's not entirely my fault. Fan theories about Jean Jacket have been amazing, ranging from a marine biologist who tried to draw out what Jean Jacket's anatomy would look like, as well as speculation that Jean Jacket would most likely be a product of a gas giant and perhaps the reason the Eye of Jupiter has been static. 